As the great Dylan Thomas has said, rage, rage, rage against the dying of the light. In today's episode, I would like to see that this raging for the dying of the light seems to be an infinite expression, the infinite urge or you can say poetically the eternal urge to continue as a temporary being you know that means regardless of what happens to human beings we want the glow of humanity the light of humanity to carry on you know <clears throat> so I thought about it what does freedom for infinite expression imply and honestly I was sitting in this staircase believe it or not I think in staircases often <laughs> And there was a book I had written in a couple years ago, <clears throat> and I was looking, I just opened a random page of it, and I was looking at a certain passage I had wrote. And I'm going to read that passage for you, which is going to really set more of a context. <clears throat> Where existence is infinite expression from infinite reference points that you do not need to be stuck in for whenever a part is stuck a part has found the freedom that is considered to come <clears throat> where existence is infinite expression from infinite reference points those two sentences I would say would would um, <coughs> uh, relate to the talk. Anyways, so I'm thinking about uh, infinite expression. I'm thinking about the freedom of the individual human being right now as it's expressing itself. And what does that imply on a, se uh, on a level where you're comparing self to world? Do you know? So that means right now people have a comfort to express themselves as their self but many people don't have the comfort to express uh, themselves as others do you know <clears throat> that means even the actor in Hollywood has to practice his lines if that's the hassle of trying to be something you're not I would say right now there is a freedom of expression through self and I thought about a collective standpoint where right now we are an individualized objective self in the world and I feel in the future there's a huge chance we're gonna become a subjective world in multiple individual bodies because I was thinking about this notion I mean you see it in various sci-fi ideology that at some point the phones that we hold in our hands are going to be behind our eyes. <clears throat> that the access to information, to locationhood, to the experience of location would be different. That means it's as if our brains would be in biological bodies but they would be connected to some sort of cloud so technically the brain is in the computer but the computer has access to the web you know so anyways I was thinking about this notion that alright so we have a freedom of expression to be individual and right now what's happening you we're seeing that through the globalization of <clears throat> especially the emergence of the internet it's been a situation where people are seeing other ways of expression you know the other day I saw how they make eggs in Japan and I you know made a Japanese style omelette, you know, to some degree. Of course, there was percentages of failure, but <laughs> <clears throat> but I'm telling you that it was as if it was an e expression. It was a way to express. And I'm thinking that as the world is becoming more complex, and especially the more complex the world becomes, the more our comprehension of the idea of freedom, of its lack, of what nature means, what human means, compared to what machine means. Do you know, that means, I feel that right now, people are getting more and more intimate with technology because it is faster movement. <clears throat> so imagine you had a robot that would do everything for you okay 
and imagine for years, for for a long time, this robot's been doing everything. Now, if this robot stops working, you do not have the evolutionary update. That means the more technology does the job for us, the less we exist naturally. So the death of nature could be the attention of a natural being on that which isn't nature. The definition of freedom, it's different. Usually it's conditional. What does that mean? That means the person is in a, some kind of life situation, circumstance, right? And their freedom is based on how they're performing in that circumstance or how much of the circumstance they see or how much they can actually notice themselves in the process. A lot of, you can say life is just a bunch of processes, okay? In a very simple way of speaking about it. These processes are events. Now, in these events, there is a conscious faculty. Now, if the conscious faculty observes before moving, it, ha it has more to work with. If it just moves, then in, in some sense, it's like, you know what it is? It's, it's as if our, behind our eyes, our inner realms, <clears throat> things are like not, they are liquid. Ideology is in a liquid form. But when the person speaks, when the person acts, this is where the inner realm fluid has now solidified like ice, you know? So especially when it comes to human communication, you have to individualize to some degree. <clears throat> you can't be an individual, and I don't know how someone can speak without being an individual. That means we need individual points to be able to notice even the idea of the collective. For me, it's, it's this fascinating feeling that whatever I see now, how far or uh, <clears throat> how shallow or whatever, it's just that the future generations are all laughing. They are laughing at what was here that they could see that we could not. And I could hear. And it's not a laughter of, of a taunt where your future is, is dismissing you. You see, some people, they get dismissed by their past. The person was weak in the past. They find themselves in a moment they need to be strong because they have an experience of weakness. I mean, if they want to go based on habit, well, you've been weak. <clears throat> but if the person sees that there's another, there are other factors that can change the meaning of phenomena, that the person could be incredibly angry and raging at the, uh, you know, uh, raging at the deathbed of a, of, of, of a planet. But I will tell you, suddenly that person will see the butterfly. This was in one of this, honestly, I'm sharing like that. <clears throat> the poetic imagery for what I just said, it comes from the science fiction story I wrote. It's not part of the major books that I usually talk about, but it was the story where I had created this character beyond time this sort of immortal character and his name was whisper and this character was this multi-dimensional entity in the science fiction context where it would go to different moments of different human beings in the er uh, in the world in the world and the whisper would be the entity would just become a part of their event and there's a chapter where there's this uh, this kind of like very giant gorilla looking alien species but they're not gorillas you know, they look totally different. And I remember creating this context where the alien species was about being invaded, if I remember correctly. It was being invaded by a... How did they look like? Pretty much it was a species at the end of its death, uh, extinction, uh, through invasion, through alien invasion. And Whisper animates, manifests, manifests this entity called Whisper, manifests as a butterfly. And he just comes in front of the leader of the species where the species is about to be invaded, like extinct, like there's no way out. And the butterfly just flies, just as a divine sign in front of the leader of that alien species. And for them, a butterfly was like a divine symbol. A butterfly was like a sign from the gods, you know? 
Imagine right now there's a lot of butterflies, but imagine a butterfly after every million years a butterfly showed itself. You think people would catch that butterfly? People would just go in shock. Oh my god, a butterfly. You know, like how rare. You know? For example, for that character, Whisper, the character's name was Whisper, it whispers the notion was that it was a being that had experienced so many individual ways of being that it no longer needed to be individual. It was as if there was a sort of familiarity uh, of the world with the presence of that being, I would say. Because psychology is not limited to the human idea, that means it's like, this is the deepest psychological question one can ask. Who were we before we were who we were, who we are? The deepest question. Questions are really nice, because question takes things to an unknown. <clears throat> and for me, answers take the thing to the known. So answers ground the, the psyche, questions lift it up. Because the question adds additional dimensions, the answer just solidifies it. An answer, a belief, these are stamps. This is the person stamping, yeah, I believe this, there we go. Next one, I believe this too, yes, okay. I, don't dis I disbelieve this one, I'm not going to stamp it. You know, it's like we're stamping, we're imprinting our own meaning upon everything because the inner realms arise to, to the person arises as a solo viewer. Do you know? Now this notion of infinite expression, let's say we began comprehending energy as a species even way more sci-fi advanced than Tai Chi masters or Qigong masters or whatnot, or those who work with the, on an energetic level. Because you see, there's, a, there's different ways you can communicate to an animal. You can communicate to the animal as a higher entity than the animal, or you can go on the level of the animal. Imagine Tarzan communicating like the animal loved the animals love Tarzan probably you know because he was like them but when we are different from our environment then that means there's something going on as if as ancient mythology has suggested consciousness is the child of the ground the earth and the sky You know, there's, when you look at it, for example, many people know that the planet, in, in certain mythologies, the Gaian mind, it has a feminine goddess-like uh, archetype connected to it. Now, if I was to tell you the father, you would see that's the notion of the sky, the notion of time, the notion of the infinite. As if consciousness is oscillating between the finite and the infinite. Certain moments there is no self, you're just the world being. And there's, it's as if the world is meditating and you're no longer its thought. <laughs> and there's, a, there's moments where you meditate where the world is no longer your thought. And it depends on how you want to pilot your inner realms and your outer realms. The outer realms, it, I mean, it, I, I do speak about them separately just so we can have, uh, so, just so we can uh, identify the uncharted territory of the unconscious mind that we want to make conscious. <clears throat> because this life, what you see is not everything. Everybody knows this. Like right now, you can, you, what, it's like there's an opportunity cost. If you look left, you miss out on what was right. When you look right, you miss out on what was left. When you look down, you miss out on what was up. When you look up, you miss out on what was down. Do you know? And so the eyes of the person, you know, is, it, it is, it, there is an opportunity cost to existence. You cannot exist without uh, noticing that your the experiential prob probabilities in your inner realms, uh, it's as if only one will pass. Poetically speaking, you know, just like Hunger Games, only one will survive. The person can think of endless ways of doing something, but only one way of it is applicable. So the ultimate resolution to and the ultimate skill of any sort of creaturehood anywhere, do you know, is effort. That is the only thing I feel that separates uh, uh, the multidimensional with the singular. The singular don't. The singular ideology doesn't need effort. Like you can totally see if you thought that everything was empty and meaningless. Why do you need to do anything? Why do you even need to be hedonistic? Like even if you think if you, I don't know how nihilists have desires. You know, 
<coughs> how nihilists can believe in nothing when there's nothing. <laughs> that means nothing is believing in nothing, you know? So, so that's the issue. That many, many ideological systems break down once they are pushed towards becoming multidimensional. And the systems that don't break down, they, are, they were never in a dimension. You know, I would say emptiness and oneness, they're non-dual. Right now, let's say uh, there's this mystical notion that it's like behind everybody's eyes, it's one being, one intelligent being, like simultaneously one side of the coin, eight billion creatures on the planet, on the other side of the coin, it's like one massive cosmic intelligence or whatever, you know? So, so it's, this, it's this situation where if the person chooses to see this world as heaven, they will fail to update earth. Because it's strange. It's a, very, it's a very difficult moral situation when we think about behavior on a rock in the middle of nowhere. You know? It even revolutionized my, my interpretation on the value, the value of language. Because for me, language, of course, certain times... I can just say, I feel my karma is less language-based. And what I mean by that is how I am occurring, how I am being in the moment, is not a concept. And it never was. Concepts just come and go. And there is this attention that is unchanging to itself. I will tell, I will tell you this next level story. <clears throat> There was this person who was in a, back in the day in a graveyard and he was the guy who would bury people. He was like, he was a simple poor guy who that's the job he had found. And so for many years, this man had been a grave digger and whatever. He was, you know, you know helping honor the <coughs> dead and whatnot. And so <coughs> what, what happened was, this grave digger, one day, like he's been doing this for many years, 40 years, imagine. One day somebody comes up to him and says, hey man, what's the weirdest thing you've seen? I mean, you've seen, you've been here for a while in this grave. And remember, this is a story back in the day. So uh, metaphysical realities are way more real or can be way more real to people. The man who's in the graveyard and he's working, he stops for a second. This humble, simple, <coughs> working man. And the person says, what is the strangest thing you've seen? Remember, that's the question. The gravedigger looks at him and says, let me tell you what. The strangest thing I have seen is that my whole life I have seen people die but there is something within me, there is something unchanging to me that never dies. And that is the strangest thing. That means literally the dude who was working in, in, in the graveyard uh, was, was shocked about how there was an eternal attention. Not eternal attention, but there was an unchanging component to the inner witness. It's as if there's a way you're watching the world where, similar to how Christ said it very elegantly, to be in the world but not of it. You are in it. But that which is witnessing what, what it is in is not that. Do you know it's like you looking at a painting and thinking you're the painting. You know, in that moment, yes, you're in the world. You're in that painting. Your attention is looking at that painting. But the attention is not of the painting. Similar to a person driving a vehicle, imagine like an unevolved. <laughs> imagine an unadvanced alien species came down to Earth and they couldn't realize that we were not our cars. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine like an alien seeing a human car and being like, let's go talk to that creature with wheels only to see there's a soul inside. There's a human being. There's the driver, the intelligence that is driving the vehicle is not made of the vehicle. And I feel this is the mystical clue that we find, an algorithm in many mystical traditions, that the what, what is being looked at is not the looker. It's not the seer.
I think about um, infinite expression and I think about that it's the concept only exists because we have noticed a finite expression and if we hadn't noticed if we are finite if we hadn't noticed we are temporary there would be no need to be eternal there would be no need if we were not people we would not need salvation do you know but <clears throat> the thing is <clears throat> the idea of the human being changes the mind of people it changes in strange way slower than the world but is actually moving fast so here's the thing think of it this way uh, that our minds are changing, let me say it this way, our minds are changing quicker than the world, No, no, let me see how would I say it. <clears throat> I, I just want to say, like, what the image that I want to communicate is like, if the ground underneath your feet was changing quicker than you, then there would be, there would be nowhere to stand. Do you see? If the ground was changing quicker than, like, the particles in your feet <clears throat> that means there would be no, no let's say no, not a sort of stable ground um, it's as if we are imbuing objective phenomena with our own subjective uh, life we're imbuing objects subjective life in our eyes And we're also imbuing subjects with objective life when we try to shape the unknown or make the unknown something that we can know. And it all has to do with identification with the presence, energetic presence, or the form of the person, the form of the personality. If you are design-oriented, there is karma that means you can't you can't be a creature without movement and karma is movement so it's impossible to be so pure in this world that you don't exist in this world the the, the thing is that <coughs> infinite expression is a boundary when it's a potential. So it's like me looking at myself right now and being like I'm a finite expression, let's say a thousand years, two hundred, let's say four hundred years. I mean, thousand years is going to be way more advanced. I'll say, <clears throat> let's say in the next two hundred years, okay, maybe two hundred is too short. Let's say four hundred years. In the next four hundred years, human beings might be masters at living naturally and also living artificially. And so, that would mean we would be able to exist in multiple bodies simultaneously as one collective inf uh, rhythm or we can be individual any moment and that's the thing we have mastered human individualism we have seen what the individual's value can be but if we are to see an advanced civilization then we have to see the value of the collective that means if the person is entertaining an individual archetype they have to wonder about the reverse just like when you drive you gotta look at your back mirror You gotta look at all your mirrors, 
You, you need as much information as possible. After some point, it's no longer a game of belief or disbelief. It's just something that's happening, and if the person can notice it, they can ride the waves of the world. If they don't notice nature's mind prior to their own mind, then in some sense the ostrich's head is still in the dirt because of fear. That means it's like like pretty much what I'm saying is I'm saying in the future are we still going to be individuals when we have access to infinite expression? And imagine every person did whatever they wanted. You know, it makes sense individually for each person. But outside, it doesn't make sense. So, uh, to, be honor, to be honest, the inner realms adjust. We say survival of the fittest, and who were the fittest? Those who noticed the, uh, what works. Because one of the most mind-blowing revelations, I would say, in psychology, <clears throat> whether this idea has already landed or not, is that we were never an image and that is the great mystery that is the great mystery of humanity we were never an image but everything appears as an image when the eyes see the shackles on the soul the mind feels a shame that only the body after death will know everything is about piloting you are pi you are a sphere of attention and the contents in your attention are your world. And what if there were more? What if there were bigger spheres? You know, I, I remember writing a book called The Inventor Spheres. And that was my notion of saying that there is an energetic relationship one can have with existence that experience is not unauthorized. And that this world has so much design that you can say the speed of attention suggests what your antenna in a more dynamic state of mind. You know, many have wondered why is it that good wins? Why? Why is it that the good thrives, the good continues? And when you see the first thing about good and evil, Sorry guys, my I'm giving this talk outside. Sometimes my attention goes to what's in the environment. <clears throat> um, the issue with good and evil, not an issue, but you can say on a design level when you're looking at the result of what happens, is chaos is doesn't care. Order cares. That means it is the ordered, civilized human being's mind 
that can see, okay, human beings deserve better than this. Any human being that has, uh, they feel, like if you right now feel you deserve better than this, and every person should, every person on this earth, my personal view is that you should feel you deserve an advanced civilization. And you should stand in the mirror in a way where you remind yourself of that. One side sees the cries of the world, the other doesn't care. There's, there's savageness in ideology. Even though I speak about religion uh, uh, in certain contexts of, of a metaphysical, theological lens, through a the theological lens, but I will tell you, <coughs> there's a story of the libraries of Alexandria. And Omar, this conqueror at the time, he takes the libraries of Alexandria and they conquer the libraries of Alexandria. This, um, you could say back in the day, it was ideological legions. That's how I see it. For me, an ideology was... Um, was like similar to as significant as nationalism is now. Do you know? <clears throat> so, like a personal belief in the, in the how you see the universe animate. But I'm saying the notion was that when Omar came and conquered the libraries of Al Alexandria, people, his soldiers came to him and said, what do we do with all these rare books that are here? You know? And remember they were, it was a, it, it was um, um, religious, uh, Omar was a religious man, and so the person says all the all the idea all the books that disagree with the holy book uh, burn, you know, are unnecessary, and all the books that agree with the holy book are unnecessary. For me, that is an extreme notion, and of course, back in the day when people are killing each other with swords, it's like what isn't extreme. <laughs> It's like we're hoping back then people didn't fight. It's like if they didn't fight, they wouldn't, there wouldn't be people. It was like, a, it was, you know how many human beings, their life purpose was literally to animate and to, in some sense, go be a warrior on a battlefield in medieval history, like back in the day, you know? So an idea can be a bulldozer. You know, Victor Hugo says nothing is more powerful than an idea in which its time has come. That's a different angle. So that was an idea that was inhibiting the world, but then there's ideas that activate the world. Out of curiosity, uh, can people hear me in the chat section? So anyways, the implication is that the idea can dominate the dimensions, the, the multidimensional freedom of life. Truths from a certain specific dimension, th that's the opportunity cost. That's the price of belief. You stop seeing the world. You only see your world. That's the price of belief. That's exactly what we pay when an idea makes us, if we prioritize ideology more superior than actually sensitivity to life. Because to be honest, for me, I honestly, like language is a tool. You can use it. Language is like a pen. Okay? It doesn't mean we should all like think we, we, all, uh, um, think we are the pen just because we're using it. You know? <clears throat> So that's the thing. When the language makes the inner realms feel they are more real than the outer realms, it's so easy not to, excuse my language, give a shit about the, uh, what's going on uh, outside of your experience. You know? It's so easy not to care to water 
the plants of the future generations. It's very easy. It's very easy to not care. The easiest thing you can do is actually nothing. If you notice. It's the easiest thing. And it's also easy to break, like a tree takes years to grow, but it can be cut down in one day. So life has a fragility to it. And there's some people of like trying to water the plants in the garden of humanity, and there's some people who are like, yo, I don't like these plants, stomping on the, uh, 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 stomping on the garden uh, of humanity with lifeless eyes, you know? Like there is, there is a savageness in this world that I, I just by seeing it, I knew I would never understand its reason. I have seen behaviors from human beings that it was neither emotional, neither rational, neither it was just the response to the stimulus of that information processor to the world it was in. Excuse me. The implication of infinite expression and giving it freedom is is ultimately, of course, many. Th this is a dualistic dimension, so there's two crossroads for anything. That means anything. You can see it going one direction and another. There's there's a dualistic thing to this realm. Those people who understand how the duality of this plane of existence works, you can pilot in it. And the only way you understand it is if you find, get some sort of non-dual teaching. For me, uh, the ancient yogis went towards um, the invisible. Right now, the modern man is obsessed about the visible. We, without, if something is not visible, we won't even acknowledge it's there. I feel Civilization 2.0, an advanced civilization, it should be a yin-yang civilization where you witness chaos and order of various moments and it's your discretion. That means it's like, let me tell you something, any person in this world who has been a victim um, or any person who has been on the other, other side, let me tell you. Um, the, the sort of victimization mentality where the person feels they're blaming themselves for something that happened to them, um, there has to be a level of rationality where the person realizes they are moving. That means the issue with the victimization mentality with people feeling like they're victims of a discomfort, <clears throat> it, it has to be a situation where 50% you are, it's, it's up to you what happens to you, and 50% it's just the, the hand you're dealt in that moment, you know? So I would say that in, in life, like, because when I think about it, it's like, I, like, of course, I, I'm, I'm an existential creature right now, but it's, it's natural for existential creatures to wonder about the absence of existence. You know, it's a very natural thing. We, we've made a big deal about uh, death in ancient cultures. They would see it as just transition. You know, you could technically say the caterpillar died, but then what's the butterfly? You know what I mean? Like, so, so there was a sort of, so, so existence is, if, if we truly identify with it, we will, of course, fear its change. Anything you identify with and it changes, you'll freak out. It's like this. It's like, you're, imagine you're chilling like... Um, you know, uh, on your porch, and suddenly you see like an alien ship land. 
right? That is something that is outside of the range of your identification with what is real. So what happens, I feel, when even if you are a person, let's say, and you have witnessed some sort of miracle on this earth, you have witnessed something that it made no sense why it happened, but it happened. For me, I'm sometimes even thinking, like, could aliens be watching us and be like, when are they going to figure it out? When are they going to figure it out? When are they going to figure it out that there is an unknown component to all their beliefs? The unknown is the savior of shackled knowledge. That means any person, it's, it's a very phenomenal idea. Why? Because usually people feel that they need to know more to improve. And now Mr. Within is coming and telling you, hey guys, what about what you don't know? What about the unknown dimensions of life also being new dimensions of energy exploration? Because on one level I treat myself with the elegance of how I see myself. That means it's like, it's, there was a time where somebody insulted me, and I was like, is a bunch of atoms shouting at another, like another set of complex organized uh, evolutionary atoms? And I was like, what is this? I'm like, what is this? Is stuff shouting at stuff? And I realized, whether we, regardless of whether we like to be secular or non-secular, I will tell you, it's multi-dimensional and for the first time ever human beings require to have a multi-dimensional responsibility for both their outer realms and their inner realms if you're if you've got a good sense of your inner realms then you, the joy transforms into service now what does this service mean this service doesn't mean you're serving an ideology you're serving like a certain uh, lovely institution you know with a great painting you know with a with a you know, great marketing campaign. I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm telling you, this is when you no longer, it's enough for you to just receive joy of, from your inner realms. That means when you realize the value of your inner realms, they are, it's as if your imagination is a reality's guide, reality's tour guide. And that's why I'm saying when we start looking at human beings as antennas, that would be a revolutionary change in how we treat knowledge and insight and what is actually in our sight because it changes. That means everything changes. Yet, the noticing of the attributeless witness continues. Papaji, this... Um, uh, Yogi, this guru in India, this guy from France or somewhere, he came to India to see this, like, you know, liberated um, person named Papaji. And the guy says, Papaji, I've come so far, I've traveled so far from another part of the world, just tell me, what is this? What is this truth or whatever? And Papaji says, okay, let's start from here. You have been, tr you traveled, correct? And the guy's like, yeah, I traveled to here. And then he says, who traveled? And he's like, I did. Do you know? And he says, the experience, the experience of traveling in existence, it's as if, do you notice how wherever you go, it's still a moment? Something in these lines. You know, these weren't the words of Papaji, but he was saying something and he was painting this picture that you feel you have been traveling, but what life has appeared to be is an experience of an instant existence. So the instantaneity, and this is true non-duality, the instantaneity and simultaneous being of the chicken or, and the egg, or Purusha and Prakriti, consciousness and matter, are both citizens of truth.
it's just wondering about the level of the individualism we're experiencing now as human beings. Right now, it's very easy. We're natural, biological, uh, physically visible creatures. For me, the mind, or the unknown depths of the mind, or which some have poetically considered the soul, has been simply an unknown witness of the known events of my life. This is the most honest... Uh, way I can say that we're being before we do anything non-ideologically that's experience and a lot of life is not based on even subjects that much we just need language to help build an advanced civilization uh, and the value of an advanced civilization would be authorization of expression right now you could the person could be for example like some skilled person but is working a very low level job you know and so that means the skill is hidden as if civilization doesn't want to see advanced human beings it's just that certain institutions have certain opinions on what they what their own effect wants to be on the world and then people are joining that I wondered what if there was no institution to join what if you were inside the ultimate building what if this moment is an event where the individual's activity is inseparable from how the cosmos is roaring We can try to build a civilization <clears throat> based on non-dualistic principles. If we do, we would be treating ourselves uh, one sub-level underneath the human personality. Right now, we're declaring ourselves as human beings, people, you know, trying to uh, live in a great world, you know. I'm saying if we were to go one level underneath the people and not, uh, uh, the atomic level is a bunch of too, too deep. I'm saying just one level underneath what it means to be a person and you're seeing its observation of landscape and then decision making. That means there is a physical life which is your movement and there is how your mind has been singing its own song from day one. We are our instruments that strangely can, are conscious that they are part of a symphony. I feel what the evolution of civilization means is the unfathomable reach that I can't believe people feel that the meaning of life is just happiness when we're on a ship that is sinking and it's not that the earth is gonna be here it's just that I fear an inner human extinction is dawning in a strange way, where we are liberated by our technological advancement only to realize we actually went the, the other way. We were a natural evolutionary being and then unnatural factors arose. Even though the human being is a natural being that led to those unnatural factors. But what I feel is going on is imagine right now it was, we were so in the future that there was alien immigration. In one of my science fiction novels, I've created a galactic sector to the United Nations. And so, in the United Nations in the year 5025, 
uh, there is a situation going on where an alien has come and spoke about what it means and is suggesting that the idea of human civilization because you see right now our definition of our civilization is it's built based on our design but let's say aliens in the future come and join and help us build our civilization so our civilization keeps jumping imagine we have an alien but this alien is is uh, can uh, can apply to the laws of humanhood I feel we are actually in a multidimensional landscape. It's how we have accepted the realm in which we are seeing it. And when I say how, that means that the question is very important. Who is accepting before sight? What is that who? And that's the thing where in my school of thought, it's, it goes beyond the language threshold and is non-dual. That means that's a that's a the true uh, true mystic means self is unknown, world is unknown, complete. Uh, it's as if the person no longer needs to seek revelation because their eyes were it. It's too much focus on personhood. You know, it's like somebody once said, even though I disagree with this view, I feel sports like when I was a kid, I wanted to be a soccer player. But like, But there was this idea that sports is distracting people for, from the actual important things about their civilization they need to pay attention to. There's two components. I, I see myself, even though these talks seem, may, may seem metaphysically oriented, but I will tell you my approach is the world is divided between an outer realm and an inner realm and the one seeing the outer realm will feel like the inner realm the moment you are moving in the outer realms you feel you have inner realms but when you stop moving and are still and silent poetically you are an inner realm where there's no inner or outer you're just the presence so this notion of the inner realm and the outer realm you know what it is it's like even though it's impossible but imagining trying to visualize just like how someone can visualize like you know a, a, a pie in the sky you know like you can just visualize an object or look at any object around you and just copy paste visualize that in your inner realms you know The inner realms and outer realms can sync. That's the Jungian synchronicity. All those people who feel they're seeing numbers, like uh, they feel they're seeing um, uh, signs from the universe, that's the synchronization of your inner realm and outer realm. And you see those signs, you know when? When your inner realms, when your desire level has reduced. When you are actually enjoying and noticing your walk in this realm, you know? The outer realm is a boat. We're all in. Or more in a more modern way, I could say, it's like um, a multiplayer online uh, physical map. Do you know where we all animate as characters with genetical uh, decisions, you know, with genetical design. 
right? So we can say, I would say we are in a geometric simulation, 100%. If somebody like I, I like if there if somebody said this reality was a simulation, and you know maybe that's hard to validate, but I will tell you that it the, the, if it was a simulation or if it was not, I will hundred percent tell you the walls of this world are made of geometry. The edges of the world are geometrical rhythms; they're not local. And there's mountains in, in the galaxies. We just don't see them. I'm being poetic here, but at the same time, the future understands me better. All that you can do with the past is honor it. There is no, no, I don't even have the notion of, uh, for example, forgiveness or hatred. Those words don't mean anything to me anymore. The words are no longer masks for me, for what really is happening in life. What's happening is you. The simplicity of the breath in the in an ev four billion year old evolutionary possibility. Rabindranath Tagore says, "I slept and dreamt that life was joy." He felt life was just, yeah, go, go taste the cake. Yeah, go taste the cake ad infinitum. That's the youth is etern uh, heaven. The heaven of the child is endless play without disturbance. But those in the front lines of manifestation, or as the Sufis considered this earth as a station, you know how you go to like a subway station? This earth is a station and there's many more stations. And alterations in the state of mind is how we're these 8 billion antennas constantly reframing our known view on an unknown universe only to realize the unknown is bigger than us. For me, when I realized the unknown was the source of knowledge, you know, it was, a, I, it was as if I was laughing and crying at the same time. I was crying for all my dreams uh, for the future, but I was laughing at there was nothing that could be lost. That the moment the human being realizes humanity is in the room, <sighs> violence, how dare you? Whether we like it or not, we're all candles <clears throat> in the darkness and the meaninglessness of space. And we can totally see that it's not about finding meaning anymore. That's not enough. Like, that's important to have, again, dimensions where you're trying to uh, seek something better. But at the same time, remember, a bird needs to uh, symmetrically fly into the sky. That means the bird flies, as Rumi says, this poet, and the bird has two wings, but it doesn't even look at its wings. As if we are not actually meant to just be obsessively looking at duality only. For me, I feel the moment we, as a species, it becomes mainstream, this idea I'm telling people that there the are inner realms, there is an inner realms, then you know how many new types of exploration in, 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 in psychology departments should begin? I feel there's going to come a moment where the educational systems of the world that have continued so far are just going to, for a second, just pause, and they're all going to cry. They're going to cry and notice that all these children entered the educational system.
But where did their efforts lead? Other than financial compensation for the institution. Where did the effort of all those unique DNAs entering the educational system lead? It led to ego. And a certified one. <laughs> the declaration of clarity in a changing world. <laughs> We are truly bold creatures, you know, on a pebble in a light beam. We are trying to fee look, find truth. How adorable. <laughs>
Okay. Honestly, there is this idea that too much freedom mm -hmm. can be chaos. Mm -hmm. That you give, you give somebody who a weight that they can't hold, it's as if they, you gave them the freedom to hold something big, yet they couldn't hold it. So it's not about just freedom, it's about the overall outcome also, you know. Okay, so guys, I'm probably going to end the talk here. Um, overall suggestion, it's important for human beings to wonder about the dimensions to their existence, 
and what percentage of those dimensions arise from their inner realms, how their eyes have opened to the world and how actually the world is happening. And we can say that the world is unfathomable to the individual, but it's fathomable in certain ranges or in a certain way based on certain lenses of experience. That means we need to experience life and then we, we would, in some sense, ex unknow, how can I tell you, know the language. It's like the language of nature is action. It's instantaneous. As if the, na the secret language of nature was, didn't have ear. Like, you know, nature didn't have like an ears and a voice. It was just an event. You know, it was an occurrence. So the language of nature is noticing the event that you're in. Noticing that this life is like a very unknown... Uh, event happening in a known setting like it's 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 very like i can't understand why how philosophy was there ever was an idea of a philosopher when when any time a person wanders beyond the system that's pretty much what the philosophers did they saw how far people had seen and they're like okay what what other ways are there to look at it so every human being is na is naturally there and all that we even though we have we're individuals now and we've divided the world into professions and certain specifications of uh, acknowledgement but in reality I find we are actually uh, just conscious uh, agents in a changing universe and we are agents of change in regards to our inner realms and also we can be also to our outer realms. Anyways, uh, I need to end the talk, guys. Thanks for listening. Uh, blessings.